Hello everybody and welcome back to Data Science Foundations. Um, last time we just finished up by sort of addressing one of the the major questions that we had. So we, we started off our second half of Data Science Foundations with a question, can we learn? Can, can humans, can experts learn from data and make rules that will apply to new data they haven't seen? We then asked the subsequent, so we, so we answered that question, yes, affirmatively, and we used the techniques that we had previously in order to answer that question. We then asked a seconding question. Uh, this, this one was even more important. This was, can machines learn, right? And, and the problem that we had ran into was that machines, when they learned, the technique that they used was they looked through a lot of hypotheses and they returned the best one. But because they looked through lots of hypotheses, there were many chances, there were as many chances as there were hypotheses, that a, that a rare event would happen, this rare event being that the hypothesis would misrepresent itself, so that this rare event would happen, so there's lots of chances for this rare event to happen, and thus it's fairly likely that this rare event would happen, that the hypothesis would misrepresent itself on the real data. Um, and so we, we, were, we were in a similar situation. Can machines learn? Can we, can we show that they can learn? Um, the simple procedure that we did, which, which we spent an entire lesson on, but I think it's, it's, it's very appropriate in order to do so, uh, was that if we separated our data into two sets, a training set and a test set, uh, then we would be able to uh, show that this thing, this machine, could learn if we applied the hypothesis it chose, this rule that it chose, onto the test set. And we could see how well it learned that way. So that was that was pretty cool. Um, in addition, I also posed, I'm not sure if, if many of you did it, but if you didn't, definitely check the comprehension questions. I posed an awesome comprehension question two lessons ago, which showed that we can actually use the plug-in principle to estimate how well, this is just using the training set itself, how well something will do, a machine learning algorithm will do on, uh, on the test set. Okay, so that's, that's, that's kind of where we are. Um, today we're going to be talking about something a little bit simple, or a little bit simpler, uh, and this is the noi noise and error measure. Um, and, the, and these are just a little bit uh, small complications that we add here that are pretty important because you'll see them as we go along. So it's going to be a short lesson today, and it's a little bit of a tangent, but, but it's still relatively important. Okay, so now that we've done a little bit of a review, uh, let's go ahead and look at some new data. So, so in this case, I made some new data. Um, the data, uh, you know, one thing, I do, I do hate, hate data that sort of express this type of way. So I've got, I've got some X data and I've got some Y data. And they're both training data, so we're just using training data in this case. And I plot them both on the same plot. So just because something is two-dimensional does not mean one of them is the target. This is one of the, my little pet peeves that when people immediately think of linear regression, they think of this sort of two-dimensional thing with, with you know, one of these dimensions being the target. But in this case, it is one of the dimensions is the target. So an example will have zero, zero is its example. So x is zero, y goes to zero, x is one, y goes to one, x is two, y goes to three, x is two, y goes to four. Um, I'll go ahead and I'll make a couple of hypothesis functions. So one is that y equals x squared, two is that y equals x plus two, and three is that y equals x plus one. And I'll go ahead and I'll find out uh, how accurate each of these hypotheses are. So I just see if it's correct. If my hypothesis is correct, I'll go ahead and report it as a one. If it's incorrect, I'll report it as a zero, and I average these together uh, to go ahead and get the first hypothesis being 42% accurate. So H0 was the most accurate, so we pat ourselves on the back. Uh, you know, we take that and we apply it to our test set and we're very happy. Well, there should be a couple of things that seem very fishy to you. First, does this actually look like a quadratic function? Not really. Uh, in, in fact, it looks much more like a linear function. So saying that it's quadratic is, is somewhat strange, but this was our, our best quote unquote hypothesis that we returned. The second thing that should be fishy to you is, what do we have here? A single x value returns two different y values. How is that possible? We had originally said that there's a function, a deterministic, a real function that takes an x value and it spits out a y value. But in this case, it spit out two different y values. Impossible, right? Well, we're going to be discussing both of those things today. I just pack them both into a single lesson. Uh, the first is, is 
quite uh, quite simple, uh, but this is noise. Okay. Um, so if you if you sort of yeah, we we talked about this in the, in the sort of lesson that we brought up supervised learning. Um, and this is that, hey, it doesn't make sense. Sometimes you'll get the same loan application and you'll get a different outcome in each. Um, uh, there's, there's two sort of fundamental ideas that go behind this. And I, I, we, we can talk about it uh, initially. One of these fundamental ideas is that the world is actually a little bit of a random place. Uh, and that sometimes you can have the exact same thing, uh, the exact same ingredients and get a completely different outcome. Um, and the second thing that you can think of that's happening is that we've only measured a subset of, of the variables in question. So for example, we didn't measure necessarily how many bathrooms were in this person's house that, that submitted the loan application. And maybe that has something to do with whether they will default or not. Or we haven't measured maybe their educational debt or something like that. Um, and if we were able to measure every single thing, you know, precisely down to the atom, uh, then we could actually have a deterministic function. So it's a truly deterministic function, but because we haven't measured things, it seems random. Okay. All this means is that yes, you can have one x value with multiple different y values. Um, this is something that you that you commonly see. Uh, people can model this in very different ways, but it's just something that you should keep in mind. So noise does exist. We will talk about noise because it's actually quite important uh, later on. Um, but not for a while, I think it's less than 17 or something like that, 16 or 17. Okay, the second point, however, is the sort of more important point. Uh, and this is error measure, okay? And this is incredibly important. Um, the idea is that we've been talking about how well a hypothesis does based on its accuracy, okay? Now let me let me walk you through a situation. Um, you, you're, the, the typical situation is that you're screening for cancer or something like that. Um, and the doctor looks at his, his, his or her, her score and is like, hey, um, this patient has a 25% chance of having cancer. Now, what does this doctor do? So they, they have some machine learning algorithm. The doctor says there's a 25% chance of, of having cancer. Does the doctor go back to the patient and, and run another test and maybe possibly treat? Or does the doctor say, nah, it's, you don't have cancer, it's not likely. The doctor would of course run another test. Even if you've got a very small likelihood of, of having cancer, um, you would certainly want to report it as being, you know, hey, there's this, this dude got a 25% chance, so we should run more tests. So sometimes the answer that you give will depend on the problem statement at hand. Um, my, my favorite example of this is you're, you're, you've developed a fingerprint scanner and you develop this fingerprint scanner for a grocery store. And what the grocery store does is you, it does the fingerprint scanner and then, um, uh, and then if, if you're in the system, it goes ahead and gives you your discounts. It sort of acts like a little customer card, except for it's a fingerprint scanner. Um, now, here's the question. There's two ways you can be wrong. You can be wrong by saying, hey, you know, it didn't recognize your fingerprint or by accidentally recognizing your fingerprint as someone else's. Now, how bad are both of these situations? Well, accidentally rec recognizing your fingerprint as someone else's doesn't matter too much. You, you still get the same reward. Uh, the only difference would be people that haven't you know, subscribed to the reward program could perhaps have a chance of, of getting that same reward, but they probably don't care about that. However, there is some cost of annoyance that someone who has actually subscribed to the reward program would keep repeatedly putting their finger down and it not accepting. Uh, so in this case, you would probably want to say that anytime it, it accepted a fingerprint incorrectly, that's not so bad. But anytime it didn't accept a fingerprint incorrectly, that's really bad. So you want to penalize it in a different way. However, if you took this fingerprint scanner and you, you gave it to the FBI uh, and you said this was the access to confidential logs, what would you care about? Would you care if the FBI agent had to you know, try their finger, you know, five or 10 times in order to be correct? Or would you care that someone who's not an FBI agent would try their finger down and it would accidentally accept them? It's, an, it's a very different situation. In this case, you very much so care about the precision of your machine. You wanna make sure that every, everything that it labels as an FBI agent is truly an FBI agent. And it doesn't matter how many times the FBI agent needs to put the, his or her fingerprint down. Okay, so depending on your problem at hand, Error measures, the way that you calculate error matters a lot. Um, let me do one more. 
Uh, this final one is is a good one because it's it's got like a it's it's very similar to a problem I worked on at Facebook, in fact. Um, but people were doing loan applications, right? We we had talked about this, and they wanted to approve or deny people for loans, and their their task was. I want to either you know here's predict whether this person will default or not default, but really what the bank wants to do is they want to predict the amount of money they will make on the loan. So instead of predicting, you know, true or false, they instead want to predict the money that they'll make on this loan. Right? It's changing the prediction task. You're still sort of predicting the same thing, but you change the prediction task and you penalize uh, the error of the prediction in a different way. Just by making this change, a particular bank made ten more or ten or fifteen uh, percent more money uh, based on their loan applications formula after this. Um, so, so error measure is incredibly important. Um, the way that you penalize your errors is incredibly important. And if you're an app, if you're a data scientist in in a particular job, what you'll want to do is you want to figure out what the true business use case is for this prediction task, and you want to align this this prediction task's error as closely as you possibly can to the uh, to the benefit that this thing will have to you. So instead of predicting whether it will the loan will default or will not default, you want to predict how much money it makes because that's all really that's all the bank really cares about. Okay. So, I that's error measure. Uh, in in this case, there are a couple of error measures that are pretty important to know. Uh, two are the mean squared error and the mean absolute error. Um, so these are these are pretty common error measures, and these are error measures that you would use in a regression task. So in a classification task, as we talked about, you predict something that's qualitative. In a regression task, you predict a number, a, a real number. Um, so in this case, uh, the mean squared error means that for each point, um, the loss is the squared difference between the true value, the y value, and the predicted value. Mean absolute error is it's just the the absolute difference between the two, and you just go ahead and you average them together. So get it mean. So these are some common loss terms. If we change our view previously, instead of using just accuracy above on this prediction problem, we use mean squared error or mean absolute error. We get very different scores. So for example, with mean squared error, our first hypothesis, the one that got the best accuracy is getting the worst mean squared error, 61, instead of 1.5 and 1.1. And you'll also notice the mean absolute error, as well as the mean squared error, are going to be slightly different. They, they penalize different things. So next time you think of a prediction problem, and you, want, and you want to go ahead and do this as a data scientist, be very cognizant of the fact that this prediction problem has a, has a real world impact. And you want to tie the error of this prediction problem to that real world impact. Um, okay, so um, back to the assumptions. Uh, let's sort of see how this looks. Okay, so uh, I need to make myself a little bit smaller. Perfect. Okay, this is what the new function or what our new assumptions look like. And this is all the assumptions we will have. So let's go through this one final time. So we get samples from a random variable x. This means we get random samples. This means that we're not training on samples that are dramatically different from the population, which means we can trust that when we run bootstrapping on this sample, or on part of the sample, as we will for the test set, then we'll get an accurate estimate of how well our model will do in the real world. So this is with the plug-in principle that we talked about originally. What happens in the real world, or what happens on our own, this, this can differ, is we get samples from a random variable x. So this could be photos. People will label these photos cat or dog, and sometimes they're confused, so there's a little bit of noise. Or we get loan applications, and the real world will determine whether these loan applications are uh, defaults or not defaults. And there's always a little bit of noise. Som sometimes you know something random happens. And this noise can happen because we didn't measure things or because the world is random. It sort of depends on what your, your sort of belief system entails. It's, it's a little bit philosophical. And this is how we get the actual inputs to our problem. This is the sample. Based on the sample, we can do machine learning. First thing that we always do to our sample, we split it into a train set and to a test set. We don't look at our test set. We never look at our test set and we hold it back right until the end. Using our training set, our hypothesis set, and our error measure, we learn what the final hypothesis would be. So for example, the training set is just some data points. Hypothesis set is a set of hypotheses. And then our learning algorithm will be looking through each hypothesis, 
applying it to the training set and seeing what the defined, the user defined, so this is the data scientist defined error would be on this, uh, for this particular hypothesis on the training set would be. It goes through every hypothesis that it would like to and it reports the best one. This is the best one. So it's the hypothesis that is best as defined on your error measure. And if you change the error measure, it will change which hypothesis your learning algorithm selects. Just as you change the training set, it will select uh, or will change the uh, hypothesis that your learning algorithm selects. And just as if you change the hypothesis set, it will do that as well. The final thing that you do is you take your final hypothesis and your test set, as well as your error measure, because this is what you care about. You do bootstrapping and you do a confidence interval and you figure out what the reported confidence or what your reported accuracy or whatever your error measure might be, mean squared error, would be with your final algorithm. And you go to your boss and you say, ta-da, here it is. And your boss will be like, wow, I'm very impressed. This is awesome. Here's a raise and a promotion and a vacation home in Bermuda or whatever. So there you go. This is sort of our new supervised learning example and we're done. Uh, we're not going to change it anymore after this. That being said, we will be diving into some particulars later on. Okay, so next time uh, we're going to be covering um, some extra stuff. We're going to be talking about what happens when we have an infinite hypothesis set. So previously we've only used hypothesis sets that are, that are finite. We're going to be talking about having an infinite hypothesis set. And we're going to be going on and exploring what this means for uh, the bias variance trade-off. Why is this important? Well, if you have infinite hypotheses, wouldn't this mean that you're definitely, you're 100% likely to come up with, to get a hypothesis that misrepresents itself and thus is not good? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, so uh, finally, uh, comprehension questions. If you guys, uh, guys and gals would like, there are some comprehension questions here. Feel free to answer them, sort of write them down in a notebook, and then check the uh, comments below if someone has already answered something very similar to yours, just feel free to give it a thumbs up, be happy with yourself. If someone has not answered something similar to yours, go ahead and, and shoot it out and I'll, I'll check it out and let you know what I think about it. Um, as always, it's best to, to answer these questions. It's sort of part of, part of the learning experience. Um, okay, thanks so much and I hope to see you next time.